I have just been um, appointed by me as the Minister of Diaspora Affairs yesterday. Uh, well, the government approved it uh, without debate. So I intend to pass money from that office to the purpose of protecting Jewish communities from the rising scourge of violent anti-Semitism, and uh, therefore that money will pass, uh, and it's overdue. But we have obviously other challenges to uh, battle the, uh, the spirit, if that's what it could be called, the evil spirit of anti-Semitism, to encourage and to demand from governments worldwide to fight it, to cooperate with them in fighting it, to foster the Hebrew language, the identity, Jewish identity, the connection to Israel, which I believe is vital, as I said, for securing the Jewish future. But if you remove the state of Israel, there is no Jewish future. It's just a question of time when the Jewish people will dissipate and disappear. Whereas if Israel is strong, vibrant, powerful state that sees the importance of the connection to Jews everywhere, then we reverse that trend completely. That is essentially what we have been in the course, in process, doing in the last uh, 20 or so years uh, as we face the challenges. Our world is a cruel one. Uh, I think there is a law, a law of history that was written by uh, uh, Will Durant, one of my favorite historians, who wrote uh, at the end of his uh, productive life, uh, he wrote a thin book, the thinnest book that he wrote is The Lessons of History. And in it, he, he who was a Christian humanist of the classic tradition, writes that history does not favor uh, Jesus Christ over Genghis Khan. If anything, he says it's the opposite. You have to be strong. The weak do not survive. We see that in our area. We see that in many areas. So Israel must be strong. How can we strengthen the state of Israel? Well, we have. Look at where we were 71 years ago and look at where we are today. We are, we've increased our numbers more than tenfold. We are, uh, our economy has moved from being a closed uh, semi-socialist economy to a free market, vibrant, booming economy. And I'm very proud that I've had uh, something to do with it. We've uh, expanded the reach of our, uh, of our scientists, of our researchers, of our artists. We've built a, an army second to none, intelligence capabilities and other things, but we have to continue doing it. Now here's what has happened. We've moved, we've made Israel uh, a free market society that was involved with many, many reforms, about 60 major reforms. It necessitated the shedding of political blood, mine mostly, okay? Many reforms. And the result has been the growth of Israel's economy. Uh, our per capita income now exceeds Japan's. And probably within a year or two, we'll exceed that of J uh, B Great Britain and uh, uh, France as well. So we are moving. Our problem is not per capita income. Our problem is capita. But you got that. That's the number of people you have. Because that's what produces GDP. But happily there too, Israel's population is growing. It's the only Western population, in many cases, the only population, with the exception of Africa, that is growing so rapidly. And it's growing across the board, secular and orthodox alike. So we have a growing population, a growing per capita income, and what did we do? We reformed the Israeli economy, really um, big reforms that began in 1996 when we, you know, I lifted all the reforms of uh, the constraints on uh, international currency. Can you imagine? You couldn't get out of Israel with more than $1,000. You couldn't come in and keep the money. You would have to go through the Bank of Israel if you wanted a Newsweek subscription, you remember Newsweek? There used to be something like that. Newsweek. You have to get 
a Bank of Israel clerk to give you authorization to take out dollars to buy a Newsweek subscription. Who the hell, you know, never mind. Who would want that? But if you did, you'd have to go through that harangue. Well, we lifted it one day and then did 60 other reforms, roughly, and the economy grew. And as the economy grew, especially in the last 10 years, we nearly doubled, we nearly doubled the amount of money that we put in education, in health, in welfare. Did the population of Israel double in 10 years? Because of free market principles, all those startups that are only possible if you do free market economies, free and currency exchanges, low tax rates, who would be here if you had 65% tax rates? That's what we had before we did these reforms, okay? We got all that money and we put it in the sectors that Israel was yearning for. In transportation, you see the roads, you see the railroads, you see the bridges, you see the tunnels. We put it in hospitals, not enough, but almost double. We put it in schools. We put it in diaspora relations too. In Taglik, in Masa, you saw that. That's where the money came from. It came from growth and that's where we put it. What did we do with defense? You know, it grew, of course it grew, but a lot less. Now, why am I telling you all this? because we're at a pivot point. It has to be understood. And I'm gonna to refer to Buzi Herzog's opening remarks in a minute. Believe me, there's a method in what I'm saying here. You know that. We put the money there because we had proper defense. And as the civilian budgets grew, the defense grew very slowly. And as a percent of GDP, it went down. It went down. Our GDP grew, but our expenditures remained roughly the same. Well, we can't continue that way. We are faced with an evil empire. It's called Iran. Iran seeks to destroy Israel. It says so openly. It works for this incessantly. Iran wants to develop nuclear weapons. It's transgressing on its agreements and commitments. Iran wants to develop precision guided missiles that can hit any target in Israel within five to 10 meters. It's doing that. Iran wants to use Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen as bases to attack Israel with statistical missiles and precision guided missiles. That is a great, great danger. To ward off this danger, we have to do two things. First, we must unite, because in the face of danger, we unite. This is not a spin, this is not a line, this is a real thing that is happening as the power balance in the Middle East changes. We must be strong. And to be strong, we have to be united as a people, united in spirit, united in our quest to secure the future of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. But to be strong, you have to be strong militarily. And to be strong militarily, we have to shift now money from the civilian areas to the military areas. That is very hard to do. You can do it in a time of crisis, when things happen that everybody can see, or you can do it in anticipation of avoiding a crisis. And that requires a very broad-shouldered government. That's what we need today. We will have to change our priorities now because the first thing we must do is ensure the security and safety of the Jewish state. It is well within our powers. We have the ingenuity. We've already developed what we need, offensive and defensive weapons, but we need a lot. 
We enjoy the friendship of the United States in a solid alliance, but always we remember the principle that I enunciate time and time again during every year of my tenure as prime minister. Israel must be able to defend itself by itself against any threat. And this now requires a national commitment, a broad-based national commitment to arm the state of Israel so that we can defend ourselves by ourselves against any threat. So we need a national unity government. 